Today, I have a guest that is interested in the moments that changed human history, which is why he owes a special gratitude to uh, sheep testicles. If you're a fan of this show uh, and uh, the show Dirty Jobs, you know what I'm talking about. It's ugly. You know his voice from The Deadliest Catch, How the Universe Works, and Shark Week. His new show, Six Degrees, focuses on the synchronicity of history. The way it's all connected in its own way, from the death of Ned Kelly to a super colossal volcano. He tells the unknown stories of people who have worked their butts off, the innovators and the everyman who followed opportunities. He tells us stories in a way that you don't hear these days very often. Uh, He tells American stories. He's dedicated to America. He offers solutions to the problems of our time. Because what's truly impressive about him is the way he has affected our society, the way he inspires individualism. He goes on and on and on in this podcast about a virtue that most people avoid, risk. Today on the Glenn Beck Podcast, welcome Mike Rowe. Abortion is the leading cause of death in the U.S. and the world. It's crazy. Since Roe versus Wade, over 63 million babies aborted here in the U.S. Nearly one in four pregnancies do not choose life. In the midst of this awful pandemic, uh, you wonder if it's too big to stop. It's not. You can actually make an impact yourself. The Ministry of Preborn and Blaze Media have partnered up to help rescue babies from abortion in 2022. Preborn is the direct competition to Planned Parenthood and the largest provider of free ultrasounds in the U.S. And they have found that if you show a woman their baby with ultrasound, they hear the heartbeat, they're 80 percent more likely to choose life for their baby. So that's all that Preborn does. They just provide those ultrasounds. That's expensive. But if we're all pitching in together over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 340,000 women considering abortion. More than 169,000 babies are alive today because of this. Twenty eight dollars that sponsors one ultrasound to help save one baby's life. $140 $140 sponsorship, five babies a chance at life. All the gifts are tax deductible. You want to help? Donate. Dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby. Or just go to preborn.com slash Glenn. It's been how long since you sat on this set with me? I think I was, it feels like seven years. Yeah, you were, you were early on. Mm-hmm. And I've watched you grow and change, and you've grown this little empire of yours <laughs> that is just remarkable. Uh, thanks. You did two things that, that, helped, uh, that helped me double down on it. The first was, you won't remember this, but we auctioned off a poster I was doing all kinds of different things to raise money for the foundation, yeah. and I had this uh, work smart and hard poster. Yeah, yeah. You autographed it, I autographed it. Mm-hmm. We put it up for auction, and one of your viewers or listeners paid like $16,000 for it. And that made me think, you know what? We can raise a lot of money doing non-traditional things for the foundation. Right. And the second thing you said was, hey, the social media thing, it's kind of a nightmare, but don't be an idiot. <laughs> Okay. Get a Facebook page. Get, well, I had it, and I was I wasn't really tending to it yeah. the way I could. Yeah. But it was an easy transition for me because, like you, I always I always thought my real boss were was the people the who mm-hmm. li- watched and listened. Yeah. And so I just started using Facebook as a um, as a focus group of sorts, and uh, I woke up a I don't know a few months later, and there were six million people on there. Amazing. So it's it's made a huge difference. Yeah. Are you ever concerned about saying something and being <laughs> banished? Because you really you are very frank on things uh, right now. I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I mean, I'm I'm concerned in the sense that um, we're living in a time, obviously, 
when the consequences for wandering too far out of your lane or saying a magical word can be dire. Not even wandering out of your lane. <laughs> I don't know what my lane is. You, but... <laughs> you, you take up half the pool, my friend. Your lane is wide and deep. <laughs> but uh, so you are worried. Have you had any? Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, my, my, my first real brush with cancellation came before the cancel culture thing was a thing. Mm-hmm. I narrated a Walmart commercial. And the, and the Walmart commercial uh, basically announced the reopening of factories and trumpeted the company's intention to spend a quarter of a, a trillion dollars over the next 10 years in supply chain. I don't work for Walmart, didn't have a deal with them, but I agreed to narrate the spot because I thought it was really simpatico with my foundation. And I like the idea of a big American company investing in American manufacturing. And so I narrated this thing, a beautiful spot, aired during the Olympics, in fact, about eight years ago, I guess. And um, well, before I went to bed, I, you know, I posted something, uh, shared a copy of the spot. Some people loved it, but the union issue. Oh my God. Mm. People were like, how could you? How could you get in bed with a company that treats its workers so poorly? And so I thought, uh. whoa. You must be this tall to get on that ride, right? I didn't sign on for that. I just had a glass of wine, wrote a post, and was going to bed. Well, right. I got up in the middle of the night, as men of our age do, to take mm-hmm. care of business. I looked again at the Facebook page, and this thing had gone around the world. What happened next was incredible. I was, uh, I was boycotted by an organization called Jobs for Justice. Mm. And they were challenging me to come out and meet with Walmart workers. Meanwhile, like I said, I have no relationship with the company. And, <laughs> I and just, just, just did the uh, voice work. I need a labor nightmare, yeah. like I need a hole in the head, right? So I'm like, I, I can't really deal with that. But they crashed my website. They had thousands of people writing letters and they were calling for boycotts of everything that I was involved in. I didn't even know who these people were. Meanwhile, I'm out in the press defending both myself and weirdly enough, Walmart. <laughs> Right. And so uh, the next night I'm on CNN, then I'm on Fox News and we're having this giant conversation about work and about unions and about manufacturing. And suddenly I realize, wait a second, there's a weird upside to this because I'm in the midst of something, but I'm also using it to promote my foundation. Meanwhile, Walmart's getting all kinds of tailwind because the dirty jobs guy is out there in the world talking about the importance of revitalizing the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, we get a call from the president of Walmart and his uh, head of PR saying, in no uncertain terms, what the the hell are you doing? You're out there speaking on our behalf. I'm like, well, somebody should. (laughs) Right. And I'm not really speaking on your behalf. I'm speaking on my behalf. Right. So were they kind of mad at you? They weren't mad because on the one hand, they loved this commercial and their initiative, I believe, was sincere. And they were getting more unearned media and attention than, than they ever imagined. I was getting boycotted, on the other hand. And so... Mary, my partner, and I, we, we just decided, you know what? We, we have to get in front of it. We scheduled our own satellite media tour. We called our own press people, and I went out in the world to have the conversation. Mm. And it was, the, it was the craziest thing, right? But I, I could, it was like stepping off the curb and having someone grab you at the last minute when the big blue bus goes by. Right. Because it could it have tilted. Right. So what I wound up doing was writing an open letter to Jobs uh, with Justice. And I, and I explained that they crashed our website and we're a small ma and pa company. And I further explained that the people you're representing who work for Walmart, what are you doing? You're trying to get them another eight or 10 cents an hour. I'm offering to train them how to weld or how to learn a skill that's actually in demand, double, maybe triple their salary. So that conversation took a whole different turn. Mm-hmm. But that's a long way of saying, you, yeah, I, I'm you, mindful of it. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen your, your pushbacks, and they're brilliant. I mean, they're really, really brilliant. Well, thanks. Uh, let me stay with unions for just a second. Um, there's a goal now of uh, tripling the union membership in the next few years by the administration. They got to, they're pushing good union jobs. Hmm. 
I don't have a problem with unions when unions are needed. You know, the, the, it's always the balance. Sometimes people get too greedy at the top, and that's when a union needs to pull them back. Sometimes the unions get too greedy. They need to be pulled back. Mm-hmm. Why is it we can't ever find the, the reasonable middle ground? Because everything is always changing. You're nailing jello to a tree, right? The times are different. When the unions, the trade unions anyway, when they came about in the turn of the century, I, I don't know that anybody would have argued or disputed their relevance mm-hmm. from everything from safety to mm-hmm. working conditions, all that stuff. Um, they made their point in some areas, in some areas they didn't, right? And so everything was always constantly evolving. I wandered into this morass, this miasma, uh, and was in a really odd position because my foundation makes no distinction between right to work and union. I've trained lots of people who are happy in unions, and I've trained lots of people who are working in non-union states. Correct. But for my own self, Glenn, right, and, and I think we're probably, we've probably been in the same unions. Mm-hmm. Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, mm-hmm. AGMA. I've been in those unions for decades. And I'll tell you a true story. When I auditioned for QVC, very first job in television, unions told me not to take it. It wasn't a union shop, right? And they told me that there would be serious consequences. I had no choice. I needed to work, and it was a steady paycheck, so I violated Global Rule 1. And they didn't throw me out, but they didn't like it. And a couple years later, when I started a show called Your New Home in Baltimore that ran for 15 years, they said, you can't do that. You're not a signatory. And I said, well, I don't really have much of a choice. And they said, we're going to, you know, big con. I did it. I had to do it. They told me not to do dirty jobs. So, look. That's crazy. The union has done a lot of good. The unions I belong to. But they affirmatively, at the three most important points in my life, affirmatively discouraged me from taking a risk. And uh, risk is really the four-letter word we should probably concern ourselves with most these days. And I feel like, um, you know, everybody's searching for progress. Um, But I feel like we're being pulled back into all of the old systems. All the old systems are saying, no, no, got to do it my way, got to do it my way. Um, I feel like our government all over the world is like living in the 1950s, mm-hmm. um, mainly because a lot of our politicians were there in the 1950s. <laughs> um, I feel like the big media corporations are doing everything they can to hold on to their power. And it's a weird thing to have progress be uh, labeled progress when it's actually taking us back the other direction. Sure, because people are, it's water in their hands, you know. You can mm-hmm. hold it for a while. But look what we're doing right here. Right? Ten years ago, what, a, have done this. a podcast wasn't a thing. Like, mm-hmm. you, you built this studio. You, you got out from Fox, and you just said, wait a second. It was madness when we did it. It was risk. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you saw the risk, but like a lot of successful people, you, you didn't run from it. You actually used it. You know, and and that's the thing I worry most about today. And it, it 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 is germane to the union conversation, but it's also relevant to everything. everything from masks, our risk averse nature. I believe is the answer to your question. That's the thing that holds us back. It's the it's the fear of trying a new thing. It's the fear of consequences. It's our desire for certainty. Boy, there's been a lot of certainty Mm -hmm. over the airwaves in the Mm -hmm. last couple of years. A lot of certain-sounding experts. Mm -hmm. A lot of certain-sounding politicians. You know, we're long on certainty, but we're very, very short in authenticity and uh, and in facts. That's funny. I said about five, six years ago, the one thing I'm certain of is that I am no longer certain of anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you don't see that. From people, we are all. You're exactly right. Everybody is certain. Let me go to the mass for a second, because at the beginning, you were, you were. I think everybody can give a pass at the beginning mm-hmm. of the of COVID, because we had no idea what we were dealing with, and we all wanted to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody wants to kill anybody, and nobody wants to die. 
when did you change on that? What is what's how have you evolved on that? Because you were I gave I was the last public speaker at the last large public event in the country started on March 9th. It was the Construction Expo in Las Vegas. And had it started on the 10th, they would have canceled the whole thing. But once you get 300,000 dirty jobbers in mm-hmm. Vegas to buy heavy equipment, mm-hmm. right? Right. That party doesn't end. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And so it was the strangest thing. You know, Monday, NFL starts canceling and then the then the NBA and then baseball and then Broadway closed. And meanwhile, my job there is to shake hands. And mm. every 10 minutes, the loudspeaker says, avoid all contact. Don't touch anybody. When I went home after five days of shaking tens of thousands of hands, I was pretty sure I was riddled with it. You know? <laughs> right. Got home on Friday the 13th, just in time uh, for, the gover- for the governor to lock California down. And uh, like everybody else, obviously, I was, you know, I'm washing vegetables. I'm looking yeah. at the news. I'm trying to make sense of all this. Um, and two weeks to flatten the curve made me nervous, but it also made sense. Our health care system is either overrun or it's not. Yep. And we don't yep. want it overrun. So I was on board with all that. Me too. I participated in PSAs. You know what I regret most, Glenn? I said about probably very, very early in April, I was uh, doing the first Zoom show in mm-hmm. prime time. I was uh, interviewing the captains on Deadliest Catch, and we were doing it long distance. And I thought it was terribly clever for me to tell these captains, you know, guys, for the first time, in my lifetime anyway, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> and everybody nodded and everybody agreed. Later, I thought about it. We're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm. What does that mean? It means your boat may vary. That guy's in a dinghy. That guy's in a yacht. That guy's on a barge. That guy's holding on for dear life to a piece of floatsome or jetsome. Mm-hmm. You know, that guy's on a pleasure cruise. And the way we weathered the storm started to become really interesting to me. And then the way we processed the risk. And then like the frog in the boiling water, the more mm-hmm. we got used to being told by certain sounding people. You know, we are we began to crave certainty. And of course, that's what happens when we're scared. And I was scared. I was scared for my mom and dad, you know, who were in their 80s, who got it, by the way, they're fine. Um, and I was scared for myself. And, and, and I was scared. I was scared because I couldn't for the life of me understand how it was going to end. And when you take the measures that we were taking with no clear rubric for success, Mm-hmm. or termination, then it's just very, very difficult to to feel good about the terminus. And there was just no terminus in this thing. If the last two years have taught us anything, is it is it that we have to take control of our own health and our own lives? Uh, we can't rely on the government or the so-called exports. Uh, we can look to science, but not the science. This is where Z-Stack comes in. Z-Stack is a uh, specially formulated immune boosting supplement. It has everything in it from zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, a whole bunch of stuff. It has everything that uh, Dr. Zelenko, he is Vladimir Zelenko, is a world-renowned doctor. He's the guy that President Trump credited with his successful early treatment protocol and his decision to take hydro- hydroxychloroquine. Um, he's been studying this from the get-go. And uh, while everybody else wants to say, oh, you can't treat it. You just have to have the jab in the arm. No, that's not true. I now take it every day. Dr. Zelenko treated me for my bout with coronavirus. By taking Z-Stack daily, you are supercharging your immune system. Z-Stack, formulated to help combat any and all variants as well as the flu. So start taking it right now. Stay ahead of any potential variants. Boost your immune system. It's ZStackLife.com slash Beck. ZStackLife.com slash Beck. I remember thinking, why aren't more people saying, why can my Home Depot open, but my local true value hardware Mm. can't? It it was for a country that, you know, questions the big pharmaceutical uh, companies and Mm -hmm. questions big business. 
we threw mom and pop down way under the bus way under the bus I'll t- i spoke at a gathering of the you'll laugh because this is just one more association maybe you know about it maybe you don't but the national association of hardwood floor and carpet installers <laughs> Okay. okay. All right. So 5,000 people show up at this thing, and they're all mon pa operations, and they do what their association's name would suggest. But for the last two years, they, they, they couldn't work. To your point, all the big box guys did. Now, this association needs to hire, in the next four to five years, 180,000 people. They're paying $25 an hour to apprentice Right, people that have no experience putting in a hard floor, and they've got a path to a really good career. Glenn, they can't find anybody. I know they 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 can't find them. And this is one association representing tens of thousands of people that have to hire a lot. There are so many associations in the country right now. The energy business has its back against the wall. The cable business, the broadband business, everybody's looking for skilled labor, right? And nobody can find it. So. That really started to worry me, too, as this went on. You'll laugh at this, too, regarding masks. I Safety third. Safety third. I this, love that. This crazy mask. Look at this thing. Right now, it's become, I think, like a collector's item. We've sold tens of thousands of these, raised over $400,000 for the MicroWorks Foundation. And we started doing this, I think it was in July of 2020, when it became clear to me that, okay, cloth masks don't work. Don't work. And we're being told that we have to wear a thing that doesn't work. Correct. That's what I believed then. Mm-hmm. And, and today it seems self-evident. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, well, what do you do for, what do you do for people who have who, to have to wear a mask, but don't want to. And who understand that Correct. just because you're in compliance doesn't mean you're out of danger. Correct. Right? So I wasn't taking the situation lightly or suggesting that the, the disease wasn't highly contagious and, and very, very serious. I was just saying, wait a second. This doesn't work. This isn't going to work. But if you're going to make me do a thing that doesn't work, I kind of I kind of want to be able to at least give you half the finger. Right. right? Not the whole finger. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but, <laughs> right. Maybe just a pleasant reminder. Just, just, yeah. just the tip. Right. right. And so, uh, you know. Explain safety third for people who don't know your rules. So safety third um, does not mean that safety isn't critically important. It just means that there is an orthodoxy in our country that has become a platitudinous. And that is based on the old trope, safety first. Safety first came out of uh, the vocational world, and it was an attempt and a pretty successful one to get workers more focused on the importance of being safe. But like so many other campaigns, they overreached. And in their attempt to get people more focused on safety, they said that there was nothing as important as safety. And everywhere on Dirty Jobs that I went for the first couple of years, you know, I saw these safety first banners. My crew and I sat through dozens of mandatory safety briefings, lockout, tag out procedures, confined space procedures. We went through all of it. And believe me, Glenn, we paid attention because we wanted to go home mm-hmm. with everything working. Right. Mm-hmm. And so first couple of years, nobody got hurt. Season three was craziest thing. Broken finger here broken toe there, cracked rib, singed off my eyebrows in a blast furnace, Uh, a couple concussions, nothing serious, stitches, like the wheels came off the bus. Why? We were still going through all the safety first machinations. We were just not paying attention. It was like Charlie Brown's teacher. You sit through 50 safety briefings, Right. right? The idea that somebody can tell you that your safety is their top priority, Mm -hmm. the minute you believe that, Mm -hmm. you're in danger because nobody can be more responsible for your Mm -hmm. safety than you. And if if, if the real enemy is complacency, and I believe that to be true, then we have to say something to cut through all the platitudinous garbage that lulls us into a false sense of security. Safety third became the rallying cry on dirty jobs. It simply meant, be careful. Be careful. 
I was in, uh, I was at the Grand Canyon, and uh, I went to the Native American side. Not a fence to be found. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. They built that huge glass platform out that you can walk on. Isn't that, isn't it's, that magnificent? It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and if you've been there, you know, there's no safety anywhere. There's no warnings. You know, like, hey, a couple more steps, you fall off the cliff. And uh, I asked one of the guides, I said, how many people fall off the cliff? He said, we don't have any. Correct. There's a thing, it's somewhat controversial, but it's actually at the root. This isn't just me being a smart ass, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I, I actually read a paper, it was published in Canada years ago, by a guy who talked about uh, risk equilibrium, homeostatic risk, and uh, compensatory uh, behavioral. So, so basically what all that means is everybody in this room has a different risk tolerance. Mm-hmm. And when you introduce safety protocols, an interesting thing happens to your behavior. For instance, if I, if I put a helmet on you, study after study after study shows you drive a little faster on the motorcycle. It's, I think that's why there's so many problems. You don't have the problems in, uh, in rugby that you have in the NFL. Correct. Correct. You I'm safe. You, that's right. I'm 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 in compliance. Mm-hmm. I got my gear. I can go more. Therefore, let's let's rock it. Right. I'll never forget standing on the deck of a crab boat on the Bering Sea in 2004. First time we were up there for deadliest catch, and it was sporty. I mean, 15 foot seas, Oof. sideways sleet, Oof. and we're still working at it. Right. We're hauling up pots. We're doing the whole Horrible. thing. And I walked into the wheelhouse at one point, and I'm like, hey, Captain, <laughs> OSHA? And he like looks at me. He got a cigarette burning in his mouth. He's got one behind his ear, also lit, cigarettes <laughs> everywhere. And he's looking out the window, and green water's coming over the bow. And he says, OSHA, ocean. I'm like, I get it. We're all terribly brave. But I mean, at what point? At what point do we kind of wrap this up? I got cameramen out there. I got all sorts of stuff. It's going off the rails. And he says, son, <laughs> calls me, he's my age, basically. <laughs> he, he says, son, look, I'm the captain of a crab boat. My job is not to get you home safe. My job is to get you home rich. You want to be safe? Be safe. That's on you. Now, mm. nobody in the lower 48 would ever talk to anybody like that. And I'm not even saying this was a good thing. I'm just making the point that when somebody who you think is primarily concerned with your safety, reminds you that they're not, you make sure your life jacket is on properly. Mm -hmm. You make sure you got three points of contact Mm -hmm. (laughs) all of the time. It's just like being at the edge of the Grand Canyon. There's no fence to lean against, Mm -hmm. right? And so somewhere in all of that, again, I'm not... But see, this goes back to that because it goes back to risk. Everything goes back to risk. Yeah, I mean, if you're not... You know, there's there's people who I'm sure will say this to you. Oh, you got a great job. I wish I had your job, blah, blah, blah. Do you? Because I can sit down <laughs> and I can tell you about what I do yeah. and the risks that I have to take every day and, and everything else. And you'll probably say, I don't want to do that. You that's, know, that's correct. Right. With everything, there is risk and there's a bunch of dirty jobs you don't want to do. But that's what takes you there. Correct. Look, if anybody takes anything from this, I I think the whole safety third conversation really comes down to just rattling your cage and doing doing something to break your pattern. Something that scares you. Right. Like, I probably have signed 200, well, probably a thousand general releases. You know, you're on a TV mm-hmm. show, you got to sign a release. Um, although you didn't give me one. That's weird. Yeah, that's right. What are we doing here? Is that your uh, That's right. No, you, you have to sign the release. And, and the more hazardous the activity, typically, the thicker the release. The release and the right. finer the print. Correct. Right? When I tested a shark suit, we made a stainless steel shark suit a few years ago with the inventor. And then we threw, chummed the water dozens of reef sharks come in and I'm dressed up like Ivanhoe and this guy's dressed up like Sir Galahad right. and, and we and we jump in to right. deliberately get bitten to test the suit. It was a crazy job. Well his release said I 
blank, do hereby understand that I'm about to engage in an activity that is stupid on its face. The idea that I'm going to survive this is wishful thinking. It's going to hurt. I'm going to get bit by a shark. I know this is going to happen. Sincerely, right? I mean, it was the most straight up. You know, so it should be. I was like, huh. So if I sign this now, I'm, I'm very, very, very clear headed about mm-hmm. it. We would be so much better off. Just doing that. To tell the truth in releases, to tell the truth about safety. And if you, if, you, if you look at our relationship to risk over the last couple of years, the whole notion of COVID zero, the whole notion of eliminating it, you know, it began with, uh, what's his name, that genius? Cuomo, right? <laughs> genius. This guy, I mean, look, I, I, again, I'm trying to stay in my lane, but we're on this You're topic. Right, I know, okay. I know, no, I know. You'll remember the moment. No measure, he said, no matter uh-huh. how draconian, can be deemed an overreach if it saves a single life. That is when I started making safety third masks, mm-hmm. honestly, because good grief. The number of people who believed that, Glenn, oh, it, that is incredible. We've lost all sense of balance between freedom and safety. All sense. So where is it? How do we gain that back? I want my freedom Mm -hmm. You know, it's not where in the Constitution does it say the government's supposed to keep us safe except for guarding our borders, which they don't do, and making sure that we have a military for anybody that comes in to evade. That's it. Right. That's all. It's almost as if we realized at some point over the last couple of years that um, we were mortal. Mm. It's like, what do you mean? No, no, no. We're we're living forever, right? We're, this is what are you what are you telling me about this the, the, this new danger thing? It was the novelness of the novel coronavirus that also made me say, wait a second, what what's really novel here? I I suspect you're a fan of C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. He wrote, and this is worth a Google too. If you haven't seen this, in 1948, he answered a question. And the question was, how am I to live in the atomic age? And people were just getting their heads around the novelness of the fact Mm -hmm. that a bomb, a missile Mm -hmm. could land. I mean, a terrible, terrible thing. And I didn't live through it. But can you imagine the anxiety Mm -mm. of living in a world where you suddenly realized that there was a nuke pointed at you? All right. We're freaked out with masks and kids in schools right now. They were diving under chairs. I, I remember, Mike, you're, you and I are approximately the same age. I remember waking up in terror because we'd have these instructional films shown at school and I'd be like, wait, the whole world can be gone tonight in 11 or 18 minutes? That's crazy. I remember that, too. We, we would have been in, in, in grade school, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But our parents in 1948 were three years after Hiroshima. Correct. And they were all grown up. Mm-hmm. And they were looking around going, Correct. that was a big bomb. Mm-hmm. And it's only a matter of time mm-hmm. until the Soviets get it and so forth. And so what, what C.S. Lewis says in this is how to live in the atomic age. It's the same way you lived when at any moment the Correct. Vikings could arrive on the shore, mm-hmm. rape and plunder and do whatever they would. the way. The same way the next smallpox could come, the next black death. He goes down the list. And he says, look, it, it always feels different. It always feels new, especially when you give it a new name, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Well, guess what? Now it's, now it's 22, <laughs> right? Right. And people are starting, I think, to, I think it's only a matter of time until you get bored with being scared. You're still there. We're already there. I think America has changed. I think the whole world has changed. Enough. Enough. We got it. You know, when you get to the point, because, you know, as a student of history, I know what happened in 1918, and it was much worse than what just happened. Mm -hmm. And when this was coming down, I was one of the first people talking about it really early in January. And I said, don't fear the virus. Even though we don't know what it is, they're welding people into their houses. Don't fear the virus. Fear what the consequences are of the virus economically and to our nation. 
And that's what we've seen. You know, you you're going to deal with it. We're going to deal with it and we're going to survive or fear both. But prudence, right? Prudence. You don't you don't drive at 55 miles an hour simply because the sign says Says. you can when it's snowing. But see, but this is the this is the thing, right? But this is the thing. We weren't. People right. were already self-isolating. They were already saying, I remember when the when the president said we're going to close everything for 15 days. And I was like, well, join the club. Mm-hmm. I mean, because we were already self-isolating. Sure. People, people, it that made sense to people. What didn't make sense is how long it went on and still going on in some places. Canada. That's look, if there's no exit strategy, then there's no exit. Talk to the people. Talk to the people as we're here on fear for a second. We're entering a time that we haven't seen maybe since World War II, the Civil War, revolutionary, where there are right now serious consequences for going against, you know, the the accepted narrative, mm-hmm. whatever that narrative is. It's changed. <laughs> I don't know how many times here, mm-hmm. but Canada, we have a woman who. It was one of the main organizers. She's facing 10 years in prison in Canada. They've lost their livelihood. They lost everything they had in the bank. They lost their truck. Because she contributed a couple hundred bucks to no, a GoFundMe? No, because she was an organizer. Oh. But, the, but it was peaceful. Right. You know, everything she did was square within the law, except maybe parking fines. Mm-hmm. That scares a lot of people. You see this government come down, Canadians right now, but we're having it here too. The government comes down. They're coming down to make sure you understand, don't screw with us. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you, what would you say to people about the fear of government coming down on you at this time, losing your job, losing everything? There's no mask to protect you from that. There's no PPE to protect you from that. There's no vaccine to protect you from that. The only thing that can protect you from that are your neighbors and your willingness to stand up. It's very, very hard, as you know, to be the first one to stand up. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we've seen over the last couple of years down here, I think, reminds me of that old Hans Christian Andersen, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Oh, yeah. When... The emperor is told that his garments are fantastic. And, of course, the tailors haven't made any garments at all. But they convince him that he's clothed. And he sits there in his chair and he's paraded through town naked. And all the townspeople are like, oh, well, yes, those are amazing clothes. Ooh and on. It was the kid. It was a kid who finally says, hey, that, that dude is naked, man. And then some adults started nodding like you are going, yeah, 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 he's naked. Mm-hmm. And then pretty soon, okay, we all see it. And, you know, we, you, you can't arrest the whole town, right? So I don't know where it tips exactly, but I would say to people that in so many ways, speaking only for myself, I have felt like that kid, and, and I've also felt like a bystander in the crowd. You know, I, I wasn't the first to do or say anything. I had a lot of pushback on Safety Third, I believe me. I bet you me. did. I bet you did. And had I not <laughs> donated the proceeds to my foundation, uh, I'm not quite sure how I would have positioned that Mm. publicly. But uh, to answer your question, I just think that when it tips is when we can no longer bear to be told the thing we're looking at is not the thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. We that's happening a lot now. Everywhere you look everywhere. It's happening with the language. It's happy. That protest was mostly peaceful. I saw someone (laughs) on CNN. Mm hmm. It was in the it was on a Saturday morning. It was completely peaceful. I mean, the birds were chirping in the background practically. Mm-hmm. Nothing happening. And they said, This may look like a peaceful <laughs> rally. But don't be fooled. But don't be fooled. Yeah, this is They're this sacrificing is, virgins just right. around the corner. And it was the exact opposite of when they were reporting with five with the whole city burning down right. saying it's mostly peaceful. But it's it's not just that. The border's secure. Never mm-hmm. mind the thousands of people oh you can gosh. see running over it. Um, Afghanistan was a success. Pay no attention to those bodies falling from the sky. Mm-hmm. And don't worry about the 14,000 still over there with green mm-hmm. cards who are screwed, right? Mm-hmm. It, 
on and on and on and on and on. You know, that's actually, that's what I think the Let's Go Brandon thing was. That's not what it was about when it started, but that's what it became. Because everybody in that crowd could hear what was being chanted. Yes. But the nice lady in front of the camera said, oh, can you hear them? They're saying, let's go, Brandon. And they're, you're sitting right there, awash in a level of cognitive dissonance that's almost impossible to overstate. And you say, no, actually, that's, that's not, not what, what they're, they're saying. saying. So what we're going to do now, it was kind of a do you think that was? Move. Do you think that's what she heard? Or do you think that was a brilliant, I mean, that was a brilliant cover. It was, it was a nice cover. And I thought she did it with kind of a smile and a wink, as if to say, I guess we all know what's happening. But, but she sold it. And, right. And it, if you look at the transcript, she's clearly saying, and the crowd is, is so behind you. Let's go. Oh, oh let's yeah. go, Brandon. Yeah, and, yeah. And so I, th- you know, the people I've talked to since that happened ha- have adopted that expression, not to say F. Joe Biden. They adopt that expression whenever they're asked, whenever they're asked to be a townsperson in the emperor's new clothes. Correct. And just nod and go, "Yep, those clothes sure are pretty." Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Because here we go again. Yeah. We're, we're we're being asked to believe the unbelievable. If you're one of the millions in America that suffer from daily pain, I mean, real bad pain, listen up. There is hope, and it comes in the form of Relief Factor. Every day I see testimonials of people who have tried Relief Factor for their pain, gotten their life back. I've got, in fact, do I have? I have my package for today. I take it three times a day. Take one in the morning, one at noon. Uh, and one at night, it has changed my life, changed my life. I'm not in the pain I used to be by any stretch of the imagination. Most days, I'm completely pain-free. Please, try Relief Factor. It's not a drug, but it was developed by doctors. And you can get the three-week quick start for only nineteen ninety-five. And 70% of the people who try it go on to order more. Drug-free, natural way. Get your life back. ReliefFactor.com. That's ReliefFactor.com. Um, I had a job for you to do, and I think it's a dirty job, but I think you'd be great at it. I think that you should become the new CNN ombudsman <laughs> that you just watch CNN and every couple of weeks you just come in and tell them what they've done. You know, it's so funny you said that. Somebody the other day was talking about like they, they didn't really replace Larry King. No, they didn't. You know, and, and part of the reason, I think, was because they were pretty sure that um, people didn't have the attention span or the appetite for a longer form. Hello, Joe Rogan. Hello, podcasting. Oh, I know. People are starving mm-hmm. for it. They're starving for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's... It's not just the long form. They're starving for authenticity. Which is really hard to do in short bursts. Yeah. Look, and the, very hard to fake. But if, but if you can, but if you, <laughs> you can, can fake it, if it's you, great. Once you do that, then <laughs> the world's your oyster. All right. I am. Um, I have an epigram in my book. Um, that's a quote from my favorite fictitious character, Travis McGee, who lives on a houseboat and solves crimes. John D. McDonald created him back in 1964. And among many other quotable things, McGee said, Uh, And a big, thick paragraph full of all the things he's suspicious of and all the things he's wary of. It ends with, but most of all, I am wary of all earnestness. And that right now, we were talking about certainty before, Mm -hmm. being long on certainty. Mm -hmm. Um, This is, there's never been a time, in my view, when Americans should be more skeptical of every single thing. And everything, everything, including everything I'm saying right yeah. now, every single Agreed. thing ought to be held up, weighed and measured and evaluated as best an mm-hmm. individual can can do it. But rather than being encouraged to be skeptical, we are told by our journalists to trust us, trust us. And certain sounding people in a crisp, well-modulated baritone will sit behind their microphone and tell you the way it is. Trust us, they say. And the experts in the lab coats, they say trust us. It's science. I'm science, right? 
Poli- it's not science. Notice it, it's there's the, the science. science. Whenever, yeah, you're, you know what? Whenever you put the, the in front of something, <laughs> yeah. somebody's trying to sell you something. Yeah, exactly right. So instead of being wary of earnestness, we are told, we are, it, we are cajoled, we are challenged. If you question, Glenn, you're a denier. Mm-hmm. Skepticism, which is not cynicism, by the way, or insanity, it's just skepticism. Healthy. Here, here we are surrounded by ambiguity and experts that can't agree on all sorts of things. And we are told that if we're skeptical of anything, then we're just a denier, a fill in the blank, a science denier, a climate denier, a mask denier. So rather than encouraging a skeptical mind, we seem, our institutions in particular, seem, seem convinced seem dedicated to the proposition of erasing that, right? That quality, that's what, that's what I think is under siege, and that worries me. I uh, saw an article this week in the New York Times. It was about um, the scandal of spying on the president and the reason why the New York Times hasn't covered any of that. Mm-hmm. And first they said it was all misinformation. And then the very next sentence was, and to be able to really tell this story, it's very complex with a lot of different names that people don't know. And it would require an enormous effort on the uh, on the uh, side of the reader to understand that, which makes us question whether things like this should be covered at all. It's that's incredible. The inf infantilization infantilization yeah that's what it is it's 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 look we're not children mm-hmm. and and we shouldn't be treated like children and the idea that somebody somewhere is doesn't trust us to sift through conflicting views this business with rogan fascinated me you know because the two doctors that caused all the problems i don't know them mm-hmm. you know but <laughs> But Robert Malone holds nine patents on mRNA vaccines. <laughs> I know. And the other guy, McCullough, is the most published cardiologist in the world. Now, maybe they're nuts. Maybe they're wrong. <laughs> we should have caught that before. <laughs> but, 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 but if you can't talk to people who are that credentialed. Who can you? Right. And so for all of that pushback that he got i i i found that kind of chilling because somebody neil young doesn't think i'm capable of listening to ideas that might be incorrect and mike when did when did rock and roll <laughs> become become the man yeah it's amazing to me all these especially these aging hippies that were like hey fight the power man you got the right <laughs> And now all of a sudden they're like, hey, shut up or we'll put you in jail. It's crazy. Misinformation, disinformation. Malinformation. Oh, is is that is a thing? Mal. You know what malinformation is? Had to look it up. Enlighten me. It is when somebody knows that it's a lie and is spreading it just for malice. Oh, so misinformation is somebody who doesn't know that it's true, that, that it's not mm-hmm. true. Disinformation is somebody who knows it's not true. Mm-hmm. And uh, malinformation is somebody who knows it's not true and has a heart full of malice. But don't forget the fourth. Yeah. The noble lie. OK, <laughs> the, the noble, the lie. noble lie is what right. we say when your best interest might be compromised by the truth. Let's assume masks work to tell people that masks don't work at a time when there was a shortage of mask was deemed a noble lie in order to make no, sure it was people just who a, needed. it was just a lie. It was just a lie. And we knew it was a lie. And it, it infuriated me at the time because I'm like, you sons of a bitch, you don't trust the American people. I had a bunch of masks. You know what I did? I didn't hoard them. I brought them to my local hospital. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not alone. There were millions of people who did that. You just didn't trust us. When you don't expect the best from people, you're never going to get it. Nope. You're never going to get it. Yeah. It's a... 
It's a self-fulfilling kind of kind of prophecy, and it 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 impacts public policy, but it also impacts the way we disseminate risk. And I I, I will always come back to that because it's our relationship with fear. Do you think you are more of a risk taker because I think your heart's always been into performance. I mean, you were an opera singer. So do you think, I mean, you have to risk. If you're going to be good at something, you oh. have to risk. Well, I told you earlier on, on your radio show, when I was a host, Dick Clark gave me some really, really great advice, which mm-hmm. was don't walk out and say hi, everybody, even though you're broadcasting. Talk to one person at a time. And so for 10 years or so, I, I worked really hard at being the best host I, I could be. And I got pretty facile at it, but I didn't really have any success until I learned another lesson in the sewers of San Francisco uh, where I realized I was a better guest. So if I, could, if I could be the titular figure in a program, but think of myself as a guest instead of a host, that's, mm-hmm. that was a risk. Right. It was a big risk because on dirty jobs, if if there was a pie in somebody's face, it was their pie in my face. Right. I if there's a brunt of a joke, it's me. I'm the new guy every day working with an expert who has never been on TV before, but who is quite good at his or her job. And so for me, the the willingness to be humbled on international television was the proximate cause of whatever success I've I've had, but that was a risk, and that's something I I've wanted to ask you about too. As a as a performer, you know, there's a lot of risk in dirty jobs, visually, but like the risk of leaving Fox, the risk of building this, right? The the risk of going of taking the reverse commute in your chosen field, that. You know, you you were rewarded for it, but you could have just as easily been crushed. You have to not want something so much, you know. Um, uh, this building, I bought it for four point nine million. Mm-hmm. You know, what we started negotiating at Mm-mm. nineteen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nineteen took a year. Yeah, but I didn't want it that much. And they were like, eh, it's worth 19. I'm like, well, go find that person that thinks it's worth 19. Is it? <laughs> yeah. And I started it. I said, it's worth five. And they said, no. And I didn't want it that badly. And they kept coming back. And I'd go, mm, okay, it's really great. You've, you're offering 12. Mm-hmm. Five. And I got it for four nine. <laughs> they got to five. I said, no, now it's four nine. <laughs> now is the, is the operative word, right? How much time did it take to get them where you, where you needed to get them? year a uh, year year a couple months maybe yeah, yeah. but it, it's it's the the concept is and this happens to tv people and stars i think all the time and you can see it in them mm. they get some success and then they want it and they want it to stay and so they'll start compromising and doing anything to get it and that's i think what is happening in all over the world. Sure. People are willing to compromise because they just want this. And what they don't realize is you're not going to have this. It's not going to be the same. Once you start compromising, you not only lose that, you lose everything. It's to my mind, it's not just the compromise. It's the it's the duplicativeness. Why does so much news look the same? Why does so much FM radio sound the same? Why does so much music sound the same? You know, it's once you have a little bit of success as a as a producer, as an executive producer, somebody who can make a call. Right. Um, (laughs) Dirty Jobs has been on the air 20 years. The first three episodes that aired uh, were the highest rated of the week. But the show was put on the shelf for a year because it wasn't consistent with what the network saw Mm -hmm. at the time Mm -hmm. as their core audience, Mm -hmm. right? This is not on brand. So they, so they put it on the shelf. Um, Now that was a safe bet for somebody to do, but. And probably made sense somewhat at the time. It doesn't make sense now, but somebody later took a risk Mm -hmm. and they put it back on the air knowing it wasn't quite consistent with 
mm-hmm. the brand. And guess what? It became the brand. 39 shows have evolved out of Dirty Jobs. Over 39, the 39 shows. Nine. That's crazy. It became the brand. The, the whole construct of, of a host as a guest or a guest as a host, you, you see it all the time now. The whole device of bringing the behind the scenes guys into the show, that was Dirty Jobs, right? That level of authenticity, that kind of shooting was risky. I, we didn't do second takes. That was one of my mandates. It's like, look, if, if back then I figured reality TV meant reality, right? Mm-hmm. So let's let's show you a day on the job exactly as I see it. Now, of course, we can edit, but I wanted the viewer to see a, a linear chronological look at my day, not a montage of some stuff and fast cuts and right. everything else. Right. And you know what take two is? Take two is a performance. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I, I had a, I called it the truth cam. It was just a behind the scenes camera, like a doc cam. But the mandate was simple. Mandate. Jeez, am I even allowed to say that anymore? <laughs> the mandate was simple. You never stop rolling. So Correct. whatever else happens here, you know, happens. camera goes down, plane flies over. I, I could always look to the truth cam and tell the viewer what was happening in the mm-hmm. moment. And you use the word before. If you're looking for authenticity, you find it in those little moments Mm -hmm. and it's worth its weight in gold. Um, Part of the problem with, um, with what we're facing and I think it's happening to our children. And um, if we keep paying people to stay home, we're going to have more and more problems. Um, I think Meaning has to change. A lot of people get their meaning from their jobs. I think it's why a lot of guys die after they mm-hmm. you I know, think retire. Right. Yep. So what? Where? How do we find meaning? And talk about the meaning of a job and the meaning beyond the job. Well, on the long list of things we can't control <laughs> is virtually everything. On the short list of things we we can is is that like there's no you you can't find meaning in a job there's no meaning in a job there's a meaning in you and the thing to which you assign your meaningfulness is 100 percent in your control this is why we have wretched garbage men and happy garbage men Mm -hmm. and wretched actuarial accountants and happy actuarial accountants the job and wretched billionaires and happy billionaires correct there is nothing inherently transformational about a job beyond its existence now if they don't exist then you don't have the opportunity to assign your meaning to a pursuit Mm -hmm. and and that's tragedy right but in the wide world of work what we've done, I think somewhat stupidly, is, is elevate certain jobs at the expense of other jobs. It's precisely what we've done with education. We've said, look, there's higher education, and that's the thing we want to encourage people to do. And then it's like there's this ellipses, right? Because, well, if there's higher education, ipso facto, there must be higher lower. jobs. Yeah, higher lower. jobs, but lower education, Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Now, we don't call it lower education. We call it alternative, right? So maybe the four-year thing is not for you. So we've got a lovely trade school over here for you. Or maybe this community college program, right? Which seems like, you're right, it, it does seem like that's a consolation prize. It's a vocational yeah. consolation prize. Mm-hmm. These, stu- these safety third masks led to an apprenticeship program at a little company that was on the verge of closing in North Carolina. And the woman, Donna Bryn, who runs it, went to the community college, hired four or five seamstresses, taught the craft. Their whole business came back on its mm-hmm. feet, starting around these, these goofy little masks as a fundraiser for my, for my foundation. So, look, elevating work, celebrating work, looking for opportunities in places where we're told that they might be subordinate, it's important to do that. That's why Dirty Jobs is still on the air. Nobody knows it because I never talk about it, but the number of 
multimillionaires on that show that we profiled? Oh, I bet. 40, maybe 50? I bet. You just didn't know it because they were covered in crap or mm-hmm. something worse, mm-hmm. right? And so they didn't look like success. So this is our fundamental problem. You know, if a good education can happen in a trench or through an apprenticeship program, or well, then that is perceived as a threat to people who are trying to control what higher education ought to mean. And then, of course, you just follow the money. So, so what, is, what are the secrets to success? Well, there's no real shortcut, in my view. Like the old Horatio Alger stuff, and my foundation talks mm-hmm. a lot about it. And I know I sound like an old wealthy white guy screaming from his porch at the kids. I, I don't mean to, and I, I, I try really hard not to go there, but there's just no substitute. You know, delayed gratification, a decent attitude, a sense of humor. Why a sense of humor? Well, because if you're not laughing, as my pop said, yeah. the joke's on you. Yeah, okay. Right? You, I mean, that was such an important part of Dirty Jobs. It still is. You know, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't want to go to job sites where, where there's no lightness. Doesn't matter how how grim the work mm-hmm. is, or, or how difficult, or how dangerous. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of those sites that I've been to always have this element of camaraderie, this band of brothers, which is humor's neighbor, right? And so it was really important for me on that show to make sure that that we captured that in some way, shape, or form. Because, I mean, whatever version of success you have. How can it not include Mm -hmm. joy, cheerfulness, Mm -hmm. probably the most important scout law, cheerful, right? So again, that's, that's in your control. Your work ethic is in your control. The affirmative decision to show up early, stay late, take a bite of the crap sandwich when it comes around to you and laugh through it. Those are all choices. So our work ethic scholarship program specifically looks for people who, who have those traits, those traits won't make you successful. But they I don't, go a long way. I don't know any successful person who doesn't have them. Yeah. You know, absent some lotto winners and trust fund babies, but mm-hmm. that, you know, that doesn't count. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me take you uh, two places. First of all, uh, your favorite storyteller. Well, I mean... Paul Harvey. Mm-hmm. Paul Harvey took risks. He, uh, as you know, he's a radio guy. Showed up every day in a suit and tie. Yeah, every day at his own office with just him. That's right. Yeah. Early, early, yeah. Chicago early, days. really early. Typed his own stuff. You know, he and his boy developed the rest of the story. Yeah, which inspired my podcast. The yeah. way I heard it, still does. Um, you know, Harvey Studs Terkel. Um, oh gosh, darn it, blank. CBS this morning. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On uh, the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Corralt. Charles Corralt. Even George Plimpton. You know, Plimpton was a guy who wanted to experience the thing before he wrote about it, which I admire a lot. Corralt was a guy who would rather take the back road than the highway, which I admire a lot. Paul Harvey was a guy who would tell you the end in the beginning which I thought was great. He, he was, there's just nobody. Did you ever meet him? No, I never did. But I'll tell you, it's funny. I got, I had a fun conversation with his son, you know, because when I started my podcast, I said, look, this is, this is straight up inspired by Paul Harvey. He called it the rest of the story. I call it the way I heard it. And I wanted to tell stories mm-hmm. about people you knew but I wanted to share something you didn't know about them in that inside out way. Mm-hmm. So it, it, was, it was his formula, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the podcast went up and we were up for about a year and we were doing really great. I mean, it, it was killing it. And um, <laughs> my partner, Mary, called me one day and she's like, uh, we got a uh, got a FedEx here from uh, Paul Harvey Jr., you know, it was dropped off, and I'm like, "Oh God, it's going to be a, it's an injunction, it's a cease right. and desist, right. it's a lawsuit." Mm-hmm. It was a very generous check for my foundation, with a note that said, "My dad is looking down at this right now." Oh, and how he's great! Loving it. He's oh, loving it. How great! I'm not a sentimental fool. Mm-hmm. I'm wary of all earnestness, but I it brought a tear to my eye. Mm-hmm. You know, because. Um, 
the rest of the story was probably as much Paul Harvey Jr. as oh, it yeah. was his dad. Oh, yeah. He pushed that thing forward. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, it made me think of my own dad and the things we had worked on and, you know, all the stuff we're talking about right now. Some days you think you're going to get sued and they send you a check. Some days you think you're getting a check. <laughs> uh, let me, let, let's end it on, uh, on this. The two or three times that you thought you were going to be the host of The Daily Show. <laughs> yeah, it was twice. In, in those days, I was still masquerading as a host and, and, and determined, you know, I, I hadn't had my dirty jobs epiphany in the sewer. Yeah. I was... I was a good host, and, and this, this audition came along, and they saw everybody. They auditioned over 15,000 people in, oh my gosh. In, New, in New York and L.A. It was going to be a big show. And yet, still, in the end, they have ended up with Trevor Noah. <laughs> hey, look, you know, these, <laughs> I mean, these, wow. these are uncertain times. <laughs> um, but back then, in the late 90s, you know, I didn't know what it was. I just knew that Comedy Central sounded like a fun place yeah, to work. Yeah, right, sure. And The Daily Show sounded like a show that was on every day, day. right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, there's some job security, and, you know, I can impersonate a news anchor. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're in on the joke. I auditioned. They called me back. I went back again, auditioned some more. They called me back for a third time, uh, and I got the job. They told me on a Friday congratulations, come in Monday, meet the writers. So I was very excited. I was living in New York and uh, had a great weekend, celebrated all weekend, went in Monday to meet the writers. And there was just this one woman sitting in this room and she didn't look happy. And I'm like, <laughs> is this Comedy Central? She's like, yes, but here, here's what happened. Long story short, um, Doug Herzog, who was running the place at the time, really wanted Craig Kilborn who was working at ESPN. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let him out of his contract, but over the weekend they relented. They hired Craig. I was Mm. out. And that, Glenn, that, that, (laughs) I mean, rejection is important, (laughs) but wow. Yeah. I I was like, man, I could taste that one. Yeah. So, um, but they called me and they said, look, you know, you really, you got something, kid, you know, don't quit this. You're good at this. And we think our paths will cross again. Well, son of a gun, a year later, Old Craig Kilborn gets the call, winds up doing the late show at CBS, I guess it was. And um, they call me back and they say, look, this job is basically yours. We've looked at your tape from a year ago. We'd like you to come in again, meet the folks, say hi. So I did. Were you were you skeptical the second time? No, that's the no. Thing. No, okay. yeah. it was it was like, look, I mean, I just thought there it is. I thought it was destiny. <laughs> I'm like, this, well, obviously, this is maybe. Yeah, they're, they're right, gonna, right. I come in, I meet everybody, and oh, the writers were so great, and I met the director, and I actually did a show. It never aired, but they said, let's just sit down and have some fun, and you know, here's the prompter, and maybe you can write some stuff. And I, I wrote a fun thing, and it, just, I just crushed it. It was one of those days when you go home, you're like, this is it. You just know. You did your best. Yeah. It's like if you're at the bat, you got every piece of it. Yeah. You know, it just felt right. so right. And um, as I was leaving, <laughs> Madeline Smithberg said to me, she said, look, the only way this gig isn't yours is if this network, if this, her words, cheap ass network coughs up a few million dollars for the likes of Norm MacDonald or... Um, Oh, who was the other guy? Uh, Dennis Miller or John Stewart. But that'll <laughs> never happen. He says, that'll never happen. So I said, great. Three days later, John yeah. signed a $4 million right. Dollar contract. Right. Yeah. Do you and, think you'd even be considered now? Oh, probably not. I mean, I'd be, it, it would be funny, you know, to have a, a third whack at the I apple. mean, I would. <laughs> I'm tempted. I'm trying to think who I know over there that could give you a call and say, "Well, but th- Mike, we've got <laughs> we've got a gig for you. Are you sitting down? <laughs> Your shit's Unless coming. Unless we can get anyone else. <laughs> Here's the truth, and this is probably a good place for me to land the plane. Um, I don't think I'd take it, you know, if they offered. And and I, and I don't say that because I think I'm above it or anything. I, a, a daily show is a priceless opportunity to to influence. And to push the rock up the hill and to do whatever it is you want to do. God bless Trevor Noah. You know, if he's having fun and everybody's happy, I think it's great. Never 
I mean, I went from that rejection to working for Dick Clark, where I learned some interesting things, and then I had maybe a hundred other jobs. But it wasn't until the sewer in San Francisco when I realized I was a better guest than I was a host, and it wasn't until the risk came together and the stars lined up and dirty jobs got on the air and then off the air and then back on the air. That's when my life changed. That's when the foundation evolved. That's when every good thing that's happened over the last 20 years, that's when the die was cast, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's, I haven't had the most glamorous career, but I've, you've had a great career. I've I've had a terrific run Mm -hmm. and, and I have a, a very unusual business with a really unique set. My best friend from high school is the producer on my podcast Mm. and is deeply embedded in my foundation. Mary, who you know, has been with me from the start. That woman, managing partner at a a high-end law firm with a lot of clients, she left to work with a guy who crawled through a sewer as a guest in order to build a business that ultimately let me sit here with you talking about safety third and various other concepts that have allowed my foundation to give away a million dollars every year for work ethic scholarships. So, yeah, The Daily Show would have been great. Wouldn't have gotten you here. Not here. Mike, thanks. Anytime.